worst part about winter or this time of the year post this daylight saving shit is it is 5 15 and it is pitch black outside what the what's going on Welcome back everyone to another episode of Close to Broke. Before we get too far, I'm going to ask you guys to make sure you guys got the takeout coming down. Make sure your DoorDash, your Uber Eats, all of that is on the way because today is an absolute special episode. High leverage spots, high stakes. Today is yet again going to be hosted here at the Bicycle Casino. We're going to be hosting another private game here and a massive thank you to everyone that's come out. These games have been unbelievable. If anyone happens to be interested and want to play in these games, just let me know in the in the DMs and Instagram. I can try to get you a seat. Either way, we're hopping into the very first hand of note. Armenian Matt makes a raise to $50. The action falls on me on the button, and I look down at 10 9 of spades here. If I'm going to be 3-betting here with some good hands, it's even better to have something like a suited connector here. I make it 150 to go. Only Armenian Matt makes the call, and we're going off to a flop that comes Jack 3-6 with two diamonds. So the action checked over to me. I actually prefer checking this back, but in time, I decided to throw a small bet of $100. This is okay as well. Going small a third here feels like the only right thing to do. Either way, Matt decides to make the call. We're going off to a turn card that comes the Queen of Diamonds. At this point, the action is checked over to me once again. I decide to check it back, and we're going off to a river card that is an absolute gem. It comes the Eight of Spades. We now make our flush, and even better now when the opponent leads out for $300. Of course, I can't just totally discount Matt from ever having a flush here, but if you guys know Matt, he likes to get in the mix of things. I think that there's a small chance that my opponent can level themselves into making a lose call if I raise here, so I decide to raise to $725. This is where the hand goes a little bit awry, I think. Although Matt ends up deciding to fold, I think the problem becomes is... Do I ever get worse to call me on this river by raising? And to be fair, I think the answer is not very often. Even if a player is super, super action or super loose, it's just hard to ever get called by something that doesn't contain due diamond. So don't love my play in this hand whatsoever. I think we misplayed it in a couple spots, but at the end of the day, we made money, so we'll live with it. The one thing we were learning very quickly in these private games that I'm hosting is that the games go on for quite some time. A good thing and a bad thing, as you guys know, I don't like playing for really excessive periods of times because I think over time I start playing worse. But the one positive thing is by not forcing myself to get a session in within two hours or three hours, I allow myself to allow the game to come to me a little more naturally. Either way, in this next setting, all of that is thrown out the window because we are playing the stand-up game. There is a straddle onto $20. I find myself in the hijack after the action is folded to me and I look down at King-9 offsuit. Not a great holding, but in the stand-up game, it makes more sense to raise these spots because if you lose a stand-up game, you have to pay $450 total to the table. We're playing 10-handed at this point. That means I have to pay nine different people $50 if I lose. And to this point, I haven't lost a stand-up game and I don't plan on starting today. Either way, I make it $75 to go. Both the button and the straddle make the call, which means I am going to be out of position for this hand. And one of the opponents, the button, actually standing as well. Either way, the flop comes jack, nine, deuce, with two spades and a club. Once again, not awful for my hand here, and not awful for my range from late position. So with the action checked over to me, I decided to throw out a small c-bet of $75. Only the straddler makes a call, as our opponent here, Danny, was posturing a little from the button, considering raising as a bluff, I suppose. Either way, we're going off to a turn card that comes a king of diamonds. Nice, so now we obviously make two pair, which is outstanding, with the action checked over to me. I think I make a mistake here by not betting. I think in real time, I'm thinking that if my opponent happens to have a cooler like Queen 10, I'm going to allow myself to not lose a max. But I think in real time, I can get a ton of value from inferior holdings. Some inferior two pairs obviously exist. And moreover, there's just a massive chance that I can get called by a hand that's a pair and a straight draw. Either way, in real time, we make I, what I feel like is a small error by checking. And we're going off to a river card that is disgusting in so many ways as it comes to queen of clubs this now puts a four to a straight out there which is never great and with the action checked over to me a massive sigh of relief 
comes upon me as I don't have to bluff, as my hand's too good to bluff, and I don't have to face a big bluff or a big bet for value. I check it back and our hand ends up being good. And luckily for us, we are fading the $450 stand-up bounty. Moving on. Get ready for this next hand as it is quite the roller coaster of emotions. In this next hand, the straddle is on a $20 and a familiar face that you guys will know as Sia the Bot from the Max Payne Monday Hustler, Hustler stream. She's in the game. She's somehow found herself in this game. Nobody really knows how, but she's in the game and she raises to $85. With the action over to me here from the big blind, I look down at Ace Queen offsuit and decide that I can either 3 bid here sometimes or call. The one thing that's a little worrying to me is that my opponent chose something bigger than a 3x sizing, going nearly f over 4x actually. So I think it plays better as just a call here out of position. The straddler calls as well. And we're going three ways off to a flop that comes ace, 10, 8. Great flop for us here. We're really disguised and we have a really solid holding. With the action checked over to Sia, she decides to bet $125. I decide to make the call, the straddler folds, and we're going off to a flop, or excuse me, a turn card that comes a five of spades. Once again, this doesn't change too much the board texture here. With the action checked over to our adversary, she decides to bet once again for $325. A little worrisome now for several reasons, because now we can obviously be losing to a hand like ace-5, ace-8, ace-10, and ace-king. But outside of that, not a whole lot of holdings that I think I need to be worried about. Obviously, a hand like 10-8 suited can still exist sometimes, but it's a little less likely after we make the call and the river card comes the 8 of hearts, pairing the board. Once again, I decide to check, continuing playing in flow, and at this point, I think I've made my decision. As played, my opponent's going to have a ton of random bluffs like jack-9 suited, queen-jack suited, 6-7 suited, and all random backdoor flush draws. So if, if, if our opponent happened to have a hand like King Jack of Spades, or even a hand like King Ten of Spades, they can definitely turn this hand into a bluff. All that being said, I think our opponent consists of more bluffs than value in this range if they decide to go for a big sizing, which Sia the Bot ends up deciding to do. After I check it over to her, she decides to jam it all in for $1,500. Going over the size of the pot here, it's very worrisome, but... Honestly, not that worrisome for me. I look back at my hand, realize that I don't have the ace of spades, which I think is pretty important, kind of, maybe not even that relevant. At the end of the day, I end up sticking in the massive call here, and we have now have ourselves a near $5,000 pot against a good player. And luckily for us, this time around, it's going to be in our benefit. As Sia immediately mucks her hand, and we end up finding a massive, massive double up to get this session going. Feels outstanding to pick off a big bluff, but props to Sia. Like I said, not a lot of people can find the bluffs there on the river. Luckily for us, she did. In this following hand, middle position decides to limp here. The button makes it $50 to go. And I find myself in the big blind with seven six of diamonds. This is a pretty hand, so I'm going to go ahead and make the call here. The third blind calls as well. And the limper ends up folding. We're going off to a flop here, multi-way that comes ace, jack, five, with two diamonds and a spade. Great flop for us here as we flop a flush draw, a ton of equity on an ace high board means that we're probably going to be facing some aggression. With the action checked over to the initial raiser, he decides to bet out $75. The initial raiser here is Armenian Matt, as you guys know, willing to get in the mix, willing to get things a little spicy. With the action back to me, I think multi-way, I just prefer calling here with my equity and trying to realize some of that, so does our opponent from the third blind, and we're going off to a turn card that comes a four of hearts. Well, outside of a diamond, this is probably the best card in the deck, hands down. We now have outs to the absolute coconuts here, which is outstanding. Well, the action checked over once again to Armenian Matt. He decides to crank up the aggression and throw out a bet of $300. Okay, things are now getting a little bit sketchy here, but I think in real time, the only best play here, I think the only course of action is throwing a raise. With the amount of equity we have at the end of the day, we only have seven high. And it's hard to find bluffs on board textures like this. And if you're going to find a bluff that's seven high that has this much equity, it probably makes the most sense to raise here. So in real time, I end up just making the call. But once again, I think the best play here would have been to raise. I think I was just taken aback a little bit of the sizing our opponent chose, considering how big it is. 
But at the end of the day, sometimes you got to just put the pants on, be a powerful human about it, and just take over the reins of the hand. Either way, I end up making the call here. And once again, my opponent to the left makes a call as well. And this pot is ballooned up. We have a ton of equity going to this river card that comes... A red card, but it pairs the board as it's the five of hearts. Not good. Not good at all. We end up on this river with seven high. We have a pretty easy check fold. Checks over to the Razor. Matt bets $800. I fold. The opponent to my left folds. And Matt ends up showing the six of spades. So maybe he had a hand like five, six of spades here. But even then, that sounds a little odd. I mean, props to him. He ended up getting us to fold. Obviously, we had the worst hand either way. It's hard to imagine he has a worse hand than us. But, you know, I think our raise would have worked. Too bad we didn't play that correctly. All right. Things are seeming to progress quite fruitfully. As, again, we are up on the session early on after making a big call here. And once again, we're going to be put to the test in this next hand against a fellow subscriber and an outstanding adversary by the name of chris as he's going to be the star of this show there's a 40 dollars straddle on which means there's a double straddle going on and the game is getting massive chris from late position makes it 160 dollars to go and i find myself in the small blind with pocket tens i think from the small blind or the blinds in general but just pretty much being out of position in early position i think the best option or best course of action is to either fold or three bet I think by calling here, we massively, massively handcuff ourselves post-flop. And moreover, we're just going to be in a ton of sticky situations. And lastly, we're totally capping our range here by just calling pre-flop. Uh, the likelihood of me calling with three or four people to act behind me with pocket aces would be outlandish. So you're never really protecting your range here by just flatting. That is what I end up doing. So compounding on some bad mistakes here, let's hopefully try to figure it out post-flop. Either way... Only I make the call, which is a little okay, or a little better, I should say. And the flop comes out jack-jack, three with two spades and a club. Well, the action checked over to Chris. He decides to throw out a big bet. Not that big. Going about half size here for $160. The action back on me. We have a pretty easy call. And we're going off to a turn card that came as the eight of hearts. At this point, this is a pretty decent board for my specific hand. And not that bad for my range either, as I'm obviously going to have ace-jack as well as a hand like pocket eights in my range here. Either way, I just had to check and my opponent decides to start a meaty bet of $450. This is where things are starting to get a little more scary here. It's going to be a little tougher for our opponent to have a lot of bluffs. Outside of flush draws, I think my opponent's definitely going to have a ton of value here. Either way, I end up making the call because it'd be foolish for me to fold at this juncture. And the river card comes the ace of clubs. Ugh. Well, if our opponent had the nub flush draw, he just got there somehow. And with the action checking over to him, something interesting happens. My opponent decides to go all in for $2,100. Yes, that's going nearly 2x the size of the pot. And I found myself in absolute predicament. This is a bind for many reasons. And the problem that I'm now having or that I'm trying to find a solution to is that how does my opponent end up on this river with an ace and decides to go for this sizing outside of maybe a holding like ace king i just don't see an all-in sizing making making a ton of sense for value i think my opponent's definitely gonna be capable of doing that but again our opponent either has a hand like pocket aces ace king or maybe king jack but outside of those holdings it's just really tough to go for max value here one, because I can still have a hand that contains a jack. So, again, it would be really, really weird for my opponent to just jam here with a hand like ace-king or ace-queen, ace-x, some kind of random ace here. So, it feels like the ace actually doesn't help my opponent's range a whole lot. It feels like, to me, my opponent has a hand like king-queen of spades. And the good thing is that I'm not holding a spade in my hand. So there's still a chance my opponent can have a hand like king 10 of spades, queen 10 of spades, nine 10 of spades, and all those hands obviously make sense for our opponent to have here. All of that being said, I go into one of the deepest tanks I've been in all year, and I eventually decide that Chris is a good enough player and a gangster enough player to have a bluff here, and I throw in the old hero call. And Chris gives us the good news by saying good call, Another ridiculous pot coming my way. Again, massive props to Chris. Once again, we found another opponent that just has the cojones to go for gusto. Absolute props there. 
I don't even think I'm good enough to make that play. So massive props to him. And luckily for him, he ran into the biggest station at the table who found a way to compound a bunch of mistakes, but kind of make up for it on the river. A whole righty. We're doing a mid-session update. There's been a lot to go over. God, the game is ridiculous off the chain. I'm running really good, and I made a really, really tough call against Chris. And uh, as you guys heard from the audio there, the only reason I ended up making that call was because um, Chris was at a home game that I got bluffed in the exact same spot when I had pocket tens when Mariano did that against me. So I was going to die my sword today. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to call whatever. I wish I could pretend it was a bunch of skill, but uh, it is what it is. So there's very few people that find a bluff on that river. Uh, the guy's an absolute savage of a human. Kudos to him, man. I wish I could say I'm playing well, but I'm just getting hit by the deck. So, anyways, that's it for the midception update. Let's get back inside the casino and get everybody their drinks. I've been relegated to coffee duty. Did anybody order some coffee? What do you have on the bottom? Coffee cleans. Coffee cleans. You're all in. Oh, you have the nuts. Well, the stakes of the game have officially risen. We're now playing 1020 with an optional $40 straddle. And in this next hand, Sia decides to raise to $60. The small blind makes a call. And I find myself in the big blind with King 9 offsuit. Good enough to defend, so I go ahead and do that. And the flop comes out 9 deuce deuce. There is a flush route there, being that it is the nine and the deuce of spades which we'll definitely take because we do have top pair that's a good hand here in poker initial raiser decides to see bet for 75 only i make the call here feels like raising sometimes accomplishes some stuff but in time i just make the call and we're going off to a turn card that is a little scary as it comes to 10 of clubs this does now introduce a backdoor flush draw and with the action checked over to the initial raiser she decides to throw out a bet once again and a little more on the meteor size for $200. Once again here, I think my hand's too good to ever make the fold. I think our opponent can definitely still go for value with a hand like 10-9. Either way, I make the call, and the river card comes a 10 of spades. Pretty much the nut low run out here as the flush draw comes in, as some straights get in. Not a great run out for us, so we're probably going to have to be put in a tough spot, and if that's the case, we're probably going to have a little bit of a hero fold. Either way, it won't come down to it as I check it over to Sia, and she decides to check it back. I show my hand, and unfortunately, we run into it, as our opponent has 10-6 of clubs. Turning that back to her flush draw and rivering a better pair, not great, but, I mean, so be it. We've been running so good to this point, it makes sense that we lose a small one. After starting off quite hot, things are starting to cool down a bit. We're not getting as many hands, and we are not seeing as many flops as there's a ton of raising pre-flop, a ton of action going off the walls here, and it seems like I found nothing to jump into the water with as we just haven't had any holdings. I guess to accentuate that fact, in this next holding, we look down at 7-4 spades here, and we've been pretty quiet to this point, so trying to take advantage of that image. I decide to raise it up here with a suited 15 gapper pretty much. The $60 from the hijack, the cutoff, the small blind, and the big blind all make the call. And we're going off to a flop that somehow brings us a ton of equity. As it comes jack four three, we flop middle pair here, hand of flush draw. With the action checked over to me, not a great board for me to be quite frank, and especially not multi-way, but with my specific hand, it's probably best to just get exploitative. Let's put some money in the middle, and let's see if we can't make a big draw here. I just had a bit of $100. And only the small blind, a good friend of the vlog by the name of The Recycler, you guys have seen him in past vlogs, only he makes a call, leaving himself about $500-ish dollars behind. And we're going off to a turn card that once again gives us somehow even more equity. As it comes to six of clubs, we now pick up a gutter ball to go along with our flush draw, to go along with our trips, two pair draw. We, we just have so much equity at this point here. With the action checked over to me, I think it plays best to put our opponent in maximum pressure. If our opponent happens to have a hand like 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s, I think we can get him to fold sometimes. And if he has maybe a middling or a weak jack, he can consider folding as well. I decided to put him all in for an over pot size bet of $530. Our opponent doesn't think about it for too long before deciding to make the call. We agree to run it out two times, and our opponent says, of course... The first river comes a nine of clubs, not improving us in any way. And the second river comes out a queen of diamonds, once again, not helping us in any way. 
At that point, our opponent shows Jack five of diamonds. Good hand to you, sir. The recycler is going to win this one. Well, talk about a heat check. Things are not really going in my favor here. Looking to completely turn it around after a really hot start. In this following hand, we look down at king eight of diamonds, six handed here. I'm in middle position. I decided to raise it up to $60. The cutoff makes a call, and it's the very last hand that Sia is deciding to play. She decides to three bet to 180. Really small sizing here. We're playing infinite behind, so it makes sense to just try to get a little sticky with a hand like this. So I decide to make the call, and so does the recycler. We're going off to a flop that is outstanding as it comes 996 with two diamonds. We flop a flush draw with the action checked over to the initial razor. It ends up. It ends up getting checked through. We're going off to a turn card that comes with three of clubs here. It checks the cutoff, who decides to bet $300, leaving himself about $400 behind. And with the action back on me, I think at this point, my opponent obviously has some good hand here. But I think the best play here would be to just get it all in. It's really unlikely that my opponent's ever going to pay us off if we end up making our flush here. Either way, I decided to just jam here because also it's fun. I'm trying to have some fun here, trying to get a little bit in the mix as the session is winding down. Jared pretty quickly makes a call. We agree to rent it out twice again, and he does show that he has trip nines here, 10-9. The first river card comes a queen of clubs, not improving us. And the second river card comes a beautiful red card. Too bad it's a seven of hearts. So back-to-back -back hands, we lose to the recycler. Unfortunate for us here as a hot session ended up getting a little cooled down by the time we got out to this final hand. Either way, you still book a really solid win for the day. Really happy with the way things turned out. And more importantly, either way, that's going to do it for me today here from the booth. Let's start with me in person and see how we feel after another really fun session. Okay, another successful private game session comes to a close. Watch is dead. It's like four in the morning. Long, long day of fun, but all great things come to an end. Uh, yeah, start of the session. We made two ridiculously tough calls and we really earned it today. Things the latter half of the session didn't really go all that you know, well in my direction, but either way, we're gonna come out of it alive. Feels like we really earned it today. Made two of pretty tough calls, I think, if I, if I had to say so myself. So either way, we're into the game for five and out for 85 60 so for a profit of 35 60 we'll take that i mean who's gonna complain about that i'm gonna keep grinding keep learning oh you said you want a new car when'd you get this thing Ooh, absolute whales they're just talking about their fancy cars when'd you get this dude the outro brother dude how much money you got you are a whale v8 by table you guys thought this guy was good at poker no he's just a whale this is, uh, it's just inheritance money, boys. Just trust me. Not from poker. Well, I'm not a professional poker player. Goodbye to the whale. And goodbye to you guys. Stay happy, stay healthy. More importantly, we're good at the tables, y'all. Deuces.